Welcome back to another edition of our review of Azernach's book, The Perpetual Wound. In this edition, we're going to be covering paragraph 5, so let me put it up on the board and we'll get right to it. Acceptism is a new method for going about an argument with any of three kinds of audience, a crowd, a person, and oneself. Perelman. Now, who is this Perelman guy, and what exactly is Asternach talking about here? I mean, this is very mysterious, right? Well, let me give you a principle for interpreting uh, Asternach's book, which builds on the fact that it is a chiasm, as I explained in the previous um, uh, installment of this series. What this means is, is that the front part of the book is mirrored in the, in the back part of the book, but only in mirror image. So if we find a reference to Perelman in the front of the book here, we should expect to find a corresponding reference to Perelman in the, in the back of the book. And indeed we do. So let's go back to the chalkboard and, and I'll diagram it out for you. Let's review the chiastic structure of Azernach's book here. So in the beginning and the end of the book, there's the preface and the epilogue. These parallel each other by both containing a sappy emotional story. Now, nestled right inside of here like a Russian doll is... Paragraphs 2 and paragraphs 167. Now, these are the first and the last paragraphs of the book. Both of these are, they're, they're word-for-word verbatim copies of each other, and they both talk about acceptism. So, what nestles inside of these two? Well, today we're talking about paragraph 5, and it mentions a fellow by the name of Perelman. So, sure enough, paragraph 155 also mentions a guy by Perelman. And, most importantly, Perelman is never mentioned anywhere else in the book. So we can see the chiastic structure of the book is being continued here, and we can hope to understand paragraph 5 by looking at paragraph 155 and seeing what it has to say. Okay, Ezra Nachan Perelman in paragraph 155. Kayam Perelman points out that truths are universally accepted relationships or systems of facts. Now, who is this Kayam Perelman dude? He is a guy who studied rhetoric, okay? Rhetoric is the art of persuasion. And in a nutshell he basically found out that to persuade somebody of what you don't agree with, you first have to go find what you do agree with them with. Okay? Now, let's translate this into uh, Randy Helzerman speak. This isn't exactly the phrasage which is used in uh, either Asterix's book or Prelim himself, but I think it's comparable with and can cast some uh, illumination on some, some recent YouTube debates that have been going on. Okay? Basically, that which everybody agrees on is the objectively true facts. And that which you disagree with somebody about is a subjectively true fact. And uh, there's different kinds of disagreements you can have with different kinds of people. You can disagree with a crowd of people. You can disagree with a single additional person. Or you can even disagree with yourself. In any case, this is how it breaks down. If, if there's agreement, there's objectivity. If there's not agreement, there's subjectivity. All right? Now... How can I possibly support such a radical statement like this, all right? How can mere shared acceptance of something yield objective truth, all right? Now, to answer this question, I'm going to use a uh, new technique, all right? I call this technique post-linguistic turn phenomenology, okay? Here's how it works. I am going to give you something to experience phenomenologically, right? And then... I'm going to ask you to pay very close attention to how you describe that phenomenal experience linguistically. All right? So here's how it works. Here's the experience, the phenomenological experience I, I'd like you to concentrate on. All right? What you see here are two boxes, right? Two rectangular boxes that are the same shape, both rectangular, and they're the same color. All right? But what color are they? All right? Now here's the kicker. The older you are, the more gray these boxes appear because your cornea is kind of yellow as you get older. They kind of get yellow, so these, this kind of cancels out the bluish in here. So to me, you know, I'm getting up there. To me, they look rather gray, but someone in their early 20s or, you know, a teenager, someone in the, the prime of life, these probably will look more bluish than gray to them, right? So here's the thing. It's like, say you are a young whippersnapper, and I'm an old fart, and we're both looking at these two boxes, all right? We're going to disagree about some things, and we're going to agree about some things. What we disagree about is exactly what color these boxes are. But what we do agree about is that these boxes are the same color. To both you and me, these boxes will look like they're the same color, all right? Now... That's the phenomenology. So, so now I'd like you to pay very careful attention to exactly how you describe that phenomenal experience. All right? Let's, let's examine this. First, let's talk about what the phenomenolo phenomenological experience that we agree about. All right? We agree 
the boxes are the same color. Now this is phrased as an objective truth about the boxes, right? Compare it with these boxes are the same shape. Something which we can get a, a ruler out, we can measure the size of the boxes and we can actually conclude objectively that these boxes are the same shape. They're both rectangles. But notice what we agree upon, okay, we agree that they're the same color. We phrase that also as an objective truth, right? Now let's go to what we disagree upon. When we disagree on, we say the boxes look gray to, to me, but the boxes look blue to you. Now notice we change language in a very interesting way here. We use mentalistic language. The property of being blue or gray isn't being attributed to an objective box, but to you know, a subjective box surrogate, which like appears only in your consciousness. It looks, you know, it blue, there's something that's blue, there's something that's gray, but it's not these boxes that are out there in objective reality. These, the, what we're attributing the properties to are subjective experiences. So it's like wherever there's agreement, we find the language that's used to describe that agreement is objective language. Wherever there's disagreement, we find that the language that is used to describe that disagreement is framed in terms of subjectivity, right? Now, this is a disagreement which, which uh, you know, be, are between two different people, right? But what about, uh, can you disagree with yourself this way too? Uh, yeah, sure you can. So focus on these two boxes. Here's another phenomenon that's going to happen. Focus on the color of these two boxes. And I'm sliding underneath of it here a, um, another shape. Now blink a couple of times and you'll notice that both of these boxes now, they look like they're different colors. Now you're going to have to take my word for it. These boxes are exactly the same color. All right? They look like they're two different colors, but they are the same color. I've slid this other shape underneath of these two boxes. So if you were to like take a, a measuring a spectroscope or whatever and look at the colors, the exact same spectrum of photons are bouncing off the screen as before, but they look like two different colors. Notice again, okay, we've postulated inner episodes. We're not attributing the color to the objective rectangles that are in reality, right? We are postulating and attributing this color to inner episodes, subjectivity. So if we have a disagreement with ourself even, right, this uh, this subjective language comes up, right? And once again, we can reverse the process, right? Watch very carefully and blink a couple of times and wow, they're actually the same color. So it's like, you know, describe your experience. Describe the phenomenology that you just experienced there, right? You'll probably say something like this. Well, I thought they were two different colors, but in reality, the, the two rectangles are both, you know, the same color, gunmetal gray. Where did the subjectivity go? It disappeared, right? As soon as the disagreement disappears, the subjectivity disappears. As soon as the disagreement appears, the subjectivity appears. Okay, so here's the kicker, right? And this is exactly why I found Acceptism and Azrinox's book so exciting, right? I can't think of another propositional attitude beside accept and acceptable, which does this communal thing, right? You can disagree with yourself and you can disagree with um, a crowd, but there's two different senses for accept this way too, right? So, for example, the proposition, uh, UFOs don't exist, all right? Our society does not accept, you know, accepts this proposition, right? It's really not, you know, acceptable to go out and talk about UFOs to people. They'll look at you really strange. But, of course, individually, um, some people do agree that, that UFOs exist. So, accept really has a dual a dual sense here, right? There's a, there's a real robust sense in which you can say that society accepts something and the individuals accept something, right? And it's like, um, it seems, I, I, I can't really think of any other propositional attitudes that are like this. For example, beliefs. Belief is, is definitely attributed to an individual. You can't say that a society or a group of individuals believe something you know, as a group, I mean, they may share the same belief, but it's, it's each individual, one of them is doing the believing. It's not the society, right? Whereas with accept, you can really can say that, like, you know, society as a whole either accepts that UFOs exist or accepts that the Loch Ness Monster exists or something like this or accepts that there's weapons of mass destruction in uh, Iraq or something like this as opposed to, to individuals. Okay? So this leads us to the homework, Okay. Can you think of any other propositional attitude that has this dual nature? 
Uh, if so, name it. If not, can you speculate as to why accept and acceptable would really be so unique in this regard? Why are these propositional attitudes the only ones that have this dual nature? And question number two, which one of these natures is, is more basic, right? The communal or the individual sense of accept? Now, as says, it's the individual sense, sense of accept, which is the most basic one. It's the one he's most interested in. I happen to be most interested in the communal one. So, so which one do you agree with? Do you, do you agree that the, the individual is more basic, or do you think that the communal one is more basic? So please take a whack at these homework problems, and as usual, uh, I'll look through and find the, uh, the most enlightening and most illuminating uh, answers to these, and I'll highlight them in the next series of this lecture. So uh, until then, uh, one final question. What's the color of my hoodie? See you around.